panel that we can't miss this one. And then we will come to a Q&A and, a, and a, a first a short discussion on stage and then a discussion. So Anita, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this is, this is daunting for three very different reasons. First of all, to be introduced by Nabdej Sana is a, is a real privilege because uh, he knows so much about the Dilip Singh story and brought it so vividly to life in his own book. Secondly, it's really daunting because I've got, you know, relatively a short amount of time to um, tell you the life story of a woman who I think crammed the experience of three lifetimes into her short, 70, well, short, long 72-year-old life. But what she went through in that time is, for me at least, quite mind-boggling. And the third reason, and the most important reason that this is a, a truly daunting afternoon for me, is because I feel a great weight of duty, because I feel like I'm bringing Sophia home today. To bring her to India is, is a really, it's actually quite an emotional thing. Um, so what can I tell you? Well, I've, I've sort of raided the photo album, so hopefully um, you'll be able to see a few of the pictures that, that I have found. And uh, I'll do the journalist thing. Now, they're just quite right. I, I, don't, I don't feel like a biographer particularly. I'm a journalist. I went about this in a journalisty way. Uh, so let me give you the headlines, shall I? So Fire Dilip Singh was the granddaughter of the Lion of Punjab, Sher e Punjab, we call him, Ranjit Singh. She was the daughter of Dilip Singh. She's the goddaughter of Queen Victoria. She was a socialite. She was a fashionista. The magazines devoured her fashion sense and her jewelry. She was a champion dog breeder. Uh, she was a talented horsewoman. She was also a chain-smoking competitive hockey player. Uh, she was a photographer. She was a pain in the neck <laughs> to the establishment, a thorn in the side of Winston Churchill, a rabble rouser, a brick throwing troublemaker. Uh, George V was driven so crazy by her, he was led to shout, can nothing be done about her? She was a nurse during World War I. She was the savior of children. And you know what? I'm not even all the way through her life yet. So you can tell there's rather a lot to tell you this afternoon. So, so I've been doing quite a few of those um, interviews. It's really weird, because I normally do the question asking, but I've been answering them lately. And the first question people ask me is, how did you find Sophia? And I'll tell you the honest truth. I didn't, she found me. She kind of barged her way into her, my life. So, um, so I'll take you back. I was working as a political journalist, very hectic life, very, very frenetic. And I swapped that hectic, frenetic pace for the even more uh, hectic and frenetic pace of my first child. That's my son, Harry. It's also a gratuitous baby picture to make you love me. Um, <laughs> and while I was on maternity leave, I was leafing through a magazine, a local magazine, because you get the chance when you're at home and you're not in the newsroom, you're not sort of dictated by the, the ticker all the time. And I read a local magazine and there was a picture. This picture was in that magazine. And it said simply, suffragette selling newspapers outside Hampton Court. And Hampton Court, for those of you who don't know, is a very grand palace in London. It was uh, a, one of the favored palaces for uh, countless kings until uh, suddenly one decided he didn't like it anymore and moved to Buckingham Palace instead. So it's a beautiful place. So that in itself is interesting in the picture. And I really liked, I hope you can see it clearly, but the look in her eyes to me was fascinating. Fiery, really up for a fight. But that is not what saved her from the recycling bin. Because what saved her was, even though this is a black and white picture, and even though she's dressed like an Edwardian lady, I could just tell that her skin was the same color as mine. And to be honest with you, she looks a lot like my auntie. There was some Punjabi thing going on. I couldn't <laughs> get my uh, head around at all. So I decided I'd do a little more looking into her story. And um, it was like a thread. You pull a little bit, and this avalanche comes down on your head. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background, because I think you need to understand what Sophia came from to understand what she lost. She was the granddaughter of this man here. I mentioned him before, Ranjit Singh, Sher of Punjab, the Lion of Punjab. He was a, uh, well, to Punjabis at least, and I know I can see a few in the audience, he has legendary status. For 50 years, he ruled a powerful kingdom, one of the most powerful kingdom India has known from the craggy foothills of the Khyber Pass to the lush green valleys of Kashmir. Uh, from the age of 14, he'd ridden out on his horse and conquered lands and amassed great wealth and territory and uniting disparate tribes and people of different religions. And he ruled for 50 years, a very wealthy king in a very powerful kingdom. Uh, this mythical status was kind of that he attained was, was helped by the fact that he wore on his arm, his bicep, 
a, a, a stone you may have heard of, the Kohenor diamond. 186 carats worth of rock, the size and shape of a hen's egg. He wore it strapped to his bicep. It carries a curse, and it was almost as if he was thumbing his nose against the supernatural because he was that strong. Uh, Sophia's grandmother, I knew less about. This is a picture of her. Uh, it was, it's, it's actually a portrait painted by the court artist George Richmond towards the end of her life. Her name is Jind Kaur, affectionately known by her subjects as Rani Jindan. And uh, although this is painted towards the end of her life, uh, you can tell she's a very striking woman. And in, in her youth, she was, she was extraordinarily beautiful. Um, there are things written about how she moved with the fluidity of water like a dancer. And uh, she was a captivating woman. And actually, she had a rather wily father, because almost from the time of her puberty, her father was the kennel keeper for Ranjit Singh, the one-eyed Maharaja. And uh, he used to thrust his daughter towards her, saying, take this girl, she'll rejuvenate you. And he resisted for many years, but finally he marries uh, Rani Jindan. And they have a son together, Dilip Singh, as you've heard from Navtej. And he, he summarized it very, very well. Now, uh, he never got to know his father because he was barely a year old when the lion died in his sleep peacefully. And there followed a bloodbath for succession. All of his half-brothers and, uh, 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 and sort of uh, stepmothers, or you know, all of these people in the court who were vying for the, the throne, they happily shot, murdered, poisoned, bludgeoned each other to death until the last man standing was no man at all. He was a little boy, this little boy here. And you can just see how small and vulnerable he must have been. His mother came out of further and decided to reign as regent with him on her knee, which was controversial in itself. But when he came to the throne, there were people watching and they sensed that this might be their time to strike the hitherto unassailable Sikh kingdom and those people were the British. So first they befriended this boy and then they betrayed him. They infiltrated their way into the court, they made deals with prominent members of his government. They said, look, when the time is right, you betray him, you'll get a kingdom for your pains. And so it went. There were two manufactured Anglo-Sikh wars. They ripped his mother from him, dragging her screaming from him, and locked her in a tower uh, in Lahore. And then they told this frightened little boy to sign over everything if he wanted their protection. Chaos and bloodshed all around. And they say, you sign over everything on this paper and we'll save your life. And so he does. He signs over his kingdom, his wealth, and his family's future. And this is an engraving from the time. It's called the submission of Dilip Singh. You can see the picture, hopefully on the big screen. And you can see the, 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 the power paradigm here. One boy against many, many, many grown men. And so the tragedy begins for this family. Dilip then is taken hundreds of miles away to Fatiga and put in the care of a a Scottish couple, the Logans, where he learns to be an Englishman. He plays parlor games, he reads Shakespeare, he reads the Bible from cover to cover, and as Nathaj pointed out, he converts to Christianity and breaks his mother's heart and breaks the heart of all Punjab. One person that is really delighted to hear about the conversion, she's obsessed with news about the leaf, and that's Queen Victoria, who pours over these letters which describe how urbane and charming he is, but also how beautiful he is. And you can see he was a very, very good looking man. And so when he asks at the age of 15 that he would like to see the Maharani, the great Maharani who rules the world, she says, yes, I'd love to meet him, tell him to come. So there he is before his 16th birthday, he ends up in England. And it is a passionate love between these two passionate and twisted, because in her he finds this surrogate mother, he has no mother of his own, partly because of the people who work for her, and in him she finds this exotic, interesting link to the eastern part of her empire. Around his neck, you'll see this detail, it's a, a portrait by Winterhalter, it's only a little part of this grand painting that was painted in the, in the drawing room of Buckingham Palace, but he's wearing a cameo of Victoria around his neck, because their love was very, very strong, she basically forgave him everything for a while. You know, he behaved really badly. He was very good friends with her oldest son, the Prince of Wales, and they basically ripped up London. They uh, had, well, to put wine, women, and song in the sentence is not to do justice with just how badly behaved they were. They were, they were bad, bad boys. But she forgave him. She also forgave him when he, she, he chose a really unconventional bride for his wife. This is uh, Sophia's mother, Maharani Bamba. 
who is the daughter of a German merchant and an Abyssinian slave. So there's a book right there for anyone who wants to write it. But he marries her, and uh, Queen Victoria also takes this little girl under her wing. She can't even speak English. She's deeply pious and very, very shy. But Victoria accepts it because it's what Delete wants. This is the home he built for himself in Elverdon. It's uh, in the Norfolk, Suffolk countryside, a vast expanse of flat English countryside, the Brecklands it's called. And he builds himself this house reminiscent of his life in Lahore. It's like a Mughal palace in the middle of the English countryside. These are just some of the interiors um, I, I can show you. Uh, he spends an absolute mind-boggling fortune on his house. But then Dilip really likes spending money. But it works. You know, he builds this fabulous palace with leopards in the gardens and uh, he's one of the finest hawk collections in the UK. There's a baboon, there's a lovely, one of the things I really enjoyed finding was a little cutting about um, how Dilip Singh's baboon was having constant fights with a local jackdaw. But it was a really exotic place and the great and the good all flocked there. In this picture you can see uh, Dilip in the middle in a flat cap and behind him on the chair seated with his arm like this is the Prince of Wales. So it was a home that entertained some of the most powerful people in the realm. I mean, Bamba sort of tolerated it, very, very shy. You can see she's not looking incredibly at home now, but she did it for his sake. And then in 1876, Sophia is born, and she is absolutely beloved by the family. Queen Victoria, as I say, becomes her godmother, and uh, she's deeply loved by her mother. For the first time, her mother has a placid child. She writes this letter that I'm delighted to tell you I, I've been able to feed this child myself, meaning that she could f suckle her herself, not use a, a wet nurse. And she also talked about how this child was very calm. The old nature wasn't evident in this child. She worried about her children, the other children, and their old nature rising up, which was this kind of Indianness, this kind of savagery she detected in Dilip. She didn't know about his life in India and didn't, know, and didn't want to know very much. She found it a bit terrifying. So Sophia seems destined for a life of great fortune and comfort. And if you spool forward 17 years, that's exactly what you think she's getting. This is a picture of Sophia with her two sisters. She's next to Bamba uh, in the front and behind them, the swan-necked, elegant Catherine. And this is their coming out, their debut in society. Women of aristocracy made their debut. Thereafter, you know, they were considered adults. They could be invited to parties. But more importantly, they were eligible for marriage. So their coming out, their debut, which was really only for Sophia's sake, because Queen Victoria made no secret of disliking her sisters intensely, uh, happened at Buckingham Palace. So, but this is a picture, I have to tell you, that is lying to you. This picture suggests that everything has been marvelous, and she's living a dream come true. I can tell you her life was an absolute nightmare for the eight years preceding this picture, because not only does she see her father abandon the family. He basically drops them completely because he suddenly becomes consumed with the uh, notion that he's been robbed of his kingdom. He wakes up and he thinks, these British people, this queen who I have loved, it, she's betrayed me. They stole my kingdom. And he sets about trying to get it back, a story which is very beautifully told by Nathed. Um, and in doing so, he forgets all about the people who love him. He ditches them penniless. They end up in London. Uh, nowhere to live, they own nothing, he sold everything, they're penniless, the only Queen Victoria steps in to save them. And in the meantime, the mother becomes a desperate alcoholic, that pretty young thing that you saw, and is drinking herself to death, neglecting the children. And then she dies at Sophia's bedside, holding her hand, praying for Sophia's fever to break, when Sophia contracts typhus fever. And then she sees her little brother, her world, her little Eddie, Prince Albert Edward, he dies practically in her arms of tubercular swelling. His life is so promising. He's such a, such a wonderful child, and yet he, is, uh, he, he dies at the age of 14. And then her father dies, penniless, broken, and broke, alone in a shabby Parisian hotel room. She's so affected by this grief that two years before this picture is taken, people are worried that she may not be able to exist in public life. She can't look people in the eye. She can't hold a conversation. She has no confidence at all. But this is something about the mettle of the woman. She knows that this debut is coming, and so she pulls herself out of this extraordinary grief and recreates herself into, I have to say, my worst nightmare. Uh, she turns into a socialite. 
pretty much a bubble head, I have to say. You know, she just becomes so self-obsessed about her clothes and her jewels. She loves being in magazines. She's very, really quite narcissistic. Um, and this is one of the pictures, you know, sort of symbolizing the things that she stands for. Great beauty uh, with her outfit, a uh, horse, a thoroughbred horse, which she rides famously well, and these dogs, which she has bred, which win prizes. Uh, she play acts at being Indian. It's interesting because whereas her sister Bamba really feels like she's an Indian princess, Sophia puts on the role for a photograph but never feels it. And the newspapers don't let her feel it. They, they, they love talking about her. She's a favorite topic of gossip columns and, you know, society. The, the, the woman's magazine was becoming popular and she was very much prominent in those pages. Um, they call her a thoroughly, there's one quote, it's lovely, a thoroughly English girl uh, despite her great oriental name. So they claim her as their own. They don't like the other two, but they like her. She has a home, Faraday House, Hampton Court, a very grand house with servants. These are the kitchens uh, of Faraday. So, you know, she, her life is pretty all right. How does this woman turn into this woman? That was my obsession. How does she turn into a woman who then is mentioned in the newspapers as the Hampton Court Harridan, as, a, a, as an ungrateful unpleasant, unbelievably selfish suffragette. This is how the papers then go on to portray her. Well, this country changed her, India changed her. And I hope we get to talk about this a bit more because uh, I, I know that um, uh, Nepesh just finds this interesting, but it is her association, she went on two trips to India. They were forbidden to her, but still, the girls managed to get back to India despite the fact the British had told them not to. The British were absolutely terrified that anyone with the name Dilip Singh would end up in the troublesome north and be the rallying point for rebellion. So the boys never even tried to get back and the girls slipped, slipped through the net. And Sophia becomes very close to this man, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. If you are of Indian origin, you will know how important he is for the nascent Congress movement. And then more importantly, this man here, Lala Lajpat Rai, who became her mentor and gave her that fire about why is it that in their own country the Indians must be under the boot. And she suddenly decides that it is not enough for her to be this sort of empty-headed socialite. The parties aren't going to be enough for her anymore. So she goes back with a fire, but she needs a cause. And what she finds is the suffragettes. The same cries that are coming from the nationalists, give us a voice, give us a voice. We demand the right to have a say in our future. She's hearing it from the suffragettes. No taxation without representation. That famous American cry that passes through the Indian National Congress is also being shouted from these women, these very brave women, the suffragettes. Emmeline Pankhurst, oh, by the way, I should say, that picture there, oh, can I go back? Yeah, she's driving the cart. And this is such a hugely humiliating fact for Buckingham Palace that a princess, a goddaughter of Queen Victoria, like some common cart driver, is driving these newspapers and selling them out at outside theatres and, uh, and, and uh, taverns. You know, like some commoner, they can't bear it. And that's why she does it more and more. And the suffragettes love it, because the more she does it, the more the press likes it. She becomes a PR weapon. Emmeline Pankhurst, who's the leader of the suffragettes, I don't know how many of you in, in, in India know about her, but in Britain, this woman was at one point the most powerful, the most hated, and the most arrested woman because she was willing to give up her life to get women the vote. And she had an army of followers who were willing to do the same thing. So Sophia signs up. She gives body, mind, spirit, pocket. I mean, she's one of the, the, the biggest contributors to the suffragette war chest. But more than that, she puts herself on the line, most notably on Black Friday. Uh, so there was a, a, a huge uh, uh, demonstration uh, to get the women the vote. And it seems as if they're getting close in 1910. There's a conciliation bill going through Parliament. It will give some women the vote, not all. And the suffragettes get to hear on November the 18th that it's going to be killed. So that the Prime Minister, who hates the idea, is going to suffocate it of, it of time. So they decide they're going to march on Parliament. I can't actually come out and point to you, but I can tell you from my screen, under the L, you'll see a little face poking out. This is one of the proudest moments of my career. That's Princess Sophia. So she sat at the back, because although she loved being in magazines, she didn't like it to be out of her control. But there she is, at the back of that hall. But when it came to marching on Parliament, she was right at the front. Emmeline surrounded herself with six rock star suffragettes. 
who were so famous in the country, the first doctor, the first mayor, the first member of the Institute of uh, Electrical Engineers, and Sophia. They're all walking together towards Parliament. And uh, they get there, they're jostled a bit, and all hell breaks loose. Because the police suddenly start assaulting women, sexually assaulting women, they're punching them, they're throwing them back, and they're not making any arrests. And it was a pattern of behavior. It was a, the reason some say is because Winston Churchill said, make no arrests on this day. I'm sick of these women clogging up our prisons. They're going on hunger strike. We have to release them anyway. Just tire them out and send them home. So they thought, the police, this was licensed to behave in any which way they wanted. And Sophia with Emmeline, they're pinned to the gate, St. Stephen's Gate at, at, at Westminster, a place that I've worked for many years and started to pinch myself that this happened not so long ago before the mother of all parliaments. So she's there pinned to the door. Somehow she sees a gap. She rushes up because she sees a police officer picking up a suffragette and throwing her to the ground and picking her up and throwing her to the ground. Every time this woman gets up, she's hurled to the ground again and she's worried that she, this is going to kill her. So Sophia, who is shorter than me, and I ain't no giant. I mean, she's five foot one in height. That's her stature. She had teeny, teeny feet and she was very small. She runs into this crowd, into this absolute devastation that's going on around her and shoves herself in between the police officer and the woman, getting bruised in the process and shrieks at him to let her go. And of course, faced with a celebrity, you know, it's like sort of Princess Diana suddenly popping up in your a riot. That's the stature that she had. She was this pin-up princess. He lets the woman drop to the ground and he tries to disappear, but she won't have it. Most people would have left that as a, as a good result. She follows him into the crowd, into the riot, shouting, show me your number, show me your number. In, in Britain, all police officers even now have to display their number on their uniforms. It tells you which station they're from and, and who they are. And he keeps walking to the crowd, she keeps following him, and then she sees the number B700, B700, B700. She keeps saying it to herself again and again and again until she's arrested, like many other women, but they never charge her. The thing is, she's so desperate to go to prison and serve her time as a suffragette, and she does all of these things to get arrested, but they won't put her in prison because it's too embarrassing. How do you explain that Queen Victoria's goddaughter is in prison? How do you tell the Punjab that they have some political hero in Britain fighting for rights when that is not the message that the Punjab needs to hear. The Punjab needs to be obedient. So they keep letting her go. She cannot get sent to prison no matter how hard she tries. And boy does she try. This is the census paper for 1911, which you have to fill in by law. She defaced her. So if you can see the writing, it's quite far away. No vote, no census. As women are not counted, do not count, we shall not be counted. Nothing happens. She then supports very publicly arsonists who are burning down bits of London. These are the, the gardens at Kew Gardens. The pavilion cafe is burnt down. Wind and windows on Oxford Street and Bond Street are broken. More fires, more arson, more chaos. And she continues to support them, even though others are backing away. She hurls herself like a torpedo at the Prime Minister's car and has to be dragged off it. She's got this poster pressed to his window on the day of the King's speech saying, give women the vote, and still they won't throw her in prison. This is the suffragette life that she had. There were other causes. She also fought for the Lushkas, who were the Indian servicemen. You may or may not have heard of them. They transported goods for the Raj back to England, and they were treated abysmally. Well, she raised money for a stranger's home for the Lushkas, which I think at the end of its life had seen 40,000 of these poor souls passing through. They were often dumped in England without pay, without shoes, without coats. And so she created a haven for them. And World War I, I just mentioned, she put down her rocks. Emmeline said, no more fighting. Uh, we've got to get behind our boys, and we have to support them. And so she did. But not only did she support them, she raised money for the Indian soldiers in particular, who were the first wave to go out to the Western Front, who were shivering with you know, insufficient clothing for the weather. They'd been dropped from a hot climate in their hot climate drill uniforms into this freezing, sodden trenches uh, uh, of the Western Front. And she raised money for their clothes and their boots. She actually, there's a really lovely note, she tried to get permission from the Metropolitan Police to march an elephant down Oxford Street, which they said, no, that's not going to happen. I was so, so sad about that. Uh, but she also changed her silks and her furs and she wore a nurse's uniform and she treated them. So imagine, you know, the sight. These soldiers come back from pure hell they wake up in a hospital and they see, first of all, the first Indian woman they've seen in months. And then they find out that she's the princess of Punjab, the place that they come from. 
There, there are lovely letters that they've written home saying, you will not believe, I know you will not believe, who is treating me in this hospital. She is the granddaughter of the lion. And then Sophia gets, because so many are asking, so many are saying, no one's going to believe that you, I, di I was here and that you treated me. She signs photographs. So there are these signed photographs that she sends to the men or gives to the men, and they send them home saying, look, I told you, it's really her. So uh, the sadness, I mean, there's also a tragic part of this, is that she is the only person who couldn't speak to them in their own language. She'd never learned it. So there are English nurses who are there, who've served in the Raj, who speak her own language fluently, and she can't. She has to use them to speak to her own people. Um, so these are some of the things that she did. But you know, in a biography, you want to put flesh on the bones, and you want to talk about who somebody was, what they were like. And I did find out that she was prone to depression, and she often, uh, which, I mean, today we may call it a, a, an eating disorder. She would just go off food and lose a great deal of weight. But when she was happy, she had a wicked sense of humor, acerbic and cutting. These are uh, pictures of her with her sisters. And she was a really quite funny woman. And how do I know this? Well, I also know that she loved children, a great deep tragedy, and maybe we'll get into that a bit more. But she never had them herself. None of her brothers and sisters ever had children, but she loved them. She loved them. She, this is her goddaughter who is the child of her housekeeper. She loved her so much, she didn't just give her uh, uh, love and affection and teach her how to be a lady, she gave her her name. She renamed the child Drovna, which is a diminutive of uh, Sophia's middle name. Sophia Alexandrovna is her name. And she called her Drovna, and, and three children during the Second World War who were evacuated from London, Sophia became their world when they moved in to her country home in Buckinghamshire, and she took care of them. And how do I know these things about what she was like? You know, the depression and the laughter, you might be asking. Um, that's because this is that little girl in that picture, the evacuee from London. Her name is Shirley Sarbat, and she still lives. This should tell you how recent in history this is, that women were not deemed to be fit for the, the vote. We've got living links to those suffragettes still. So this is Shirley, and this that is that little baby you saw in the princess's arms. This is Drovna today who still remembers the way she smelt, the way she laughed, the way she moved, the things she liked, and the things that made her really grumpy. So, um, oh, just one last thing before we chat amongst ourselves. Drobna, one of her favorite stories, my favorite story that she told me is that uh, the princess used to take her around Hampton Court. And she once dropped to her knees in front of this little child and she said, you have to make me a promise, a solemn, solemn vow. And the child said, yes, okay, even she didn't know what a solemn vow was. She said, you must vote. You must never not vote. When you are given the opportunity, you must always use it. And I think in this time of great political cynicism, it's a lesson that we could all take. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. That's a, a very wonderfully organized uh, 100 years of history in a, in a few minutes. Very, very competently done. Can we start with your last slide, we, you talked of the love for Drovna, yeah. which uh, Sophia obviously bestowed on her. And well, it's easy to think she had no child of her own. But is it a coincidence that Dalip, none of Dalip Singh's children had any children? He had six children from Marani Bamba, and he had two children from his second wife, Ada, and none of them had a child. I know there's a reference to one. Why don't you talk about that? It's, it, it's such a, I mean, it's horrible, actually, if you, you unpack that question, what those children went through. So there is a story, I tell it in the book, of her eldest brother, Victor, who marries a society woman, a, 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 a countess. Anna. Anne, that's right, Anne Coventry. And she's, you know, they're very happy. They're really happy together. But after their wedding, Queen Victoria asks Anne to come and see her. And Anne is thrilled. She's like, this is amazing. We are going to be shown much favor in this life of ours. And Victoria says, you must never have children. Whatever you do, you must never have children. And it was this fear, again, that a Dilip Singh would do what Sophia's father had done, which is turn you know, the, 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 the Raj upside down by trying to take back the kingdom. And Victor never does have a child. Freddie never even marries. Uh, Bamba, the oldest and angriest sister, settles in, in India, but she gets married when she's into her 50s. Uh, she doesn't have children. She also has this theory, I don't know if you came across this in your research, she said that this, she insists, and again, I, 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 I didn't include it because I'm not sure, and Bamba's quite a, 
an erratic Gatling gun of a, a human. But she used to say that the servants at Elverdon put powders in the children's food to make them all sterile. That was her uh, uh, thought. Uh, Catherine was a, a lesbian living with her governess in uh, Germany, so she never had children. And the other two from the second marriage, I mean, their life is just hideously tortured. One commits suicide, uh, and the other one goes off to France because she cannot even, be, she can't bear to be a delete thing. She can't bear to be associated with the name of this father that has brought her nothing but misery. Mm. So the line dies. It just dies. Yes, the line dies, and maybe that's the way it was intended to be. But in your answer, you mentioned the two other sisters, and if I'm going to go back to them, frankly, the daughters were far more interesting than the than the sons. Victor was a sort of gambling, drinking... Uh, Waste of space. You know, way, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kiss, casino boy. Yeah. And Freddie became this arch-conservative art collector and, and didn't want to disturb anything at all. But uh, the three sisters, I mean, Bamba, the eldest sister, was this extremely rebellious uh, princess who carried the father's anger despite yeah. what he did to them, came back to Lahore, titled herself the Queen of Lahore, yes, yeah. stayed under the shadow of Lahore fort. Yeah. And you had Catherine who was this, you know, went into Germany, who had a lesbian relationship, had this mysterious uh, German existence during the war. I mean, each of them could have been a book. Oh, Why yes. did you choose Sophia? Well, I chose Sophia because I found that she was the true inheritor of, uh, of the Ranjit Singh title. To me, anyway, it felt mm. like that. Mm. See, see Dilip, you know, they often say virtue skips a generation. And what people say about Ranjit Singh is that he saw no difference between creed and caste, that he united Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. And, and Bamba didn't, well, certainly Dilip was really concerned about himself most of the time. I don't, I don't know, I mean, I think that it was all self-serving. Even his cries to go back and take back uh, the Sikh kingdom were more about him and ha whether he had enough money to spend than it was about liberating Punjab from the British. But with Sophia, I just felt that there was that, the roar of the lion. You know, she also, despite the fact her sister was so poisoned against the British and hated them, absolutely hated them. They used to have these far fierce discussions Bamba said, you can never be friends with a British person. You cannot trust them. And she would say, I, I love you. And, you know, in most things, I'll be ruled by you. In this, you're wrong. Some of the finest people I know are British. I'm not having it. So uh, she sort of stuck to her principles, but also saw no difference between this creed and caste. And also, it's very touching in her will. She left money to three girls' schools. Uh, one was for Hindu girls, one for Sikh, and one for Muslim girls. So I really felt that that, that connection was strongest in her. And to me, it was just such a revelation, this line, you know, this line that goes into my family's ancestry. You know, we're Punjabis. You know, if you're a Punjabi, the lion means something. And so to have the grandchild who most sort of represented those, those qualities. And also, I'm a political journalist. How, am I, how can I not write about somebody who has given me the vote? Because of the sacrifice of women like her, I have the right to vote and to talk about our politicians. And really, I owe it to her. So that's why. Do you think she had the advantage of having skipped a generation? Because uh, Dalip Singh was a victim of his own fractured destiny and the fact that he was seemingly so confused because for years he was this British squire hunting pheasants and throwing uh, picnics and tennis parties and then he suddenly became this completely crazy rebel who was wandering all over Europe trying to gather an army and money to march uh, in, back into India because his sense of loss was very, very yes. immediate. Yes. And while the, the children had got distanced from their sen sense of loss and had found other causes. So maybe that is the, probably the reason that you find her sanity. Well, or you could say that, you know, they are, I mean, I, I give them more credit than, than that because I think that they were more rootless even mm. than him. You know, their own father rejects them. You know, Dilip always knew he was loved. His mother was pining for him somewhere. You know, the fact that he couldn't see her, he knew that she loved him to the very end. Uh, you know, she, th th it's, it's in the book, but I, I, I won't go into it in detail. But, you know, he goes back and gets her after these years of being a alone and, and miserable and missing him in, in Nepal, in, in this 
horrible exile, he finally brings her home and she won't leave his side, even if it means going to Britain to the people she hates mm. and who she blames for robbing her of everything. She goes back and she dies in Britain. She dies in this horrible foreign place for her. But Sophia has to live with the idea that her father didn't want her. He, could, he threw her off in his madcap dash to reclaim his kingdom as if she was nothing. He wrote a letter to the Times saying, do not let any member of my family charge anything to my account. I've washed my hands of them. It was brutal. Mm. So I think, you know, you could have gone into a spiral of despair and, you know, insecurity, which is certainly what the daughters from the second marriage did. I mean, one killed herself and wrote in her letter, I've never, I, I, forgive me, but this, I didn't know what it was to be loved. So, um, yeah, I give her more credit, actually. But, but the daughters from the first marriage at least retained a certain amount of love and respect for him, they, or did they, they not? They did. No, they did. They really did. Because I think, you know, Bamber in particular was passionate Bamber. about her father. Yes, yes. She loved him. She wouldn't hear a word said against him. She blamed it all on the British. She hated Queen Victoria. She referred to Queen Victoria as Mrs. Fagan. So did he. And so did he. So did he. The receiver of stolen goods. I mean, yeah. you know. Whereas Sophia was just much more circumspect about all of these things. She had mixed feelings because Victoria saved their lives, you know, so. You said that uh, today you feel that you brought her home. Yeah. I, I know the feeling exactly because I did a reading from my book on the leap sing in Elvedon. Wow. And I felt that, oh, the book has come home. Yeah. But yours is, uh, of course, the person coming home. But she did come home, as you mentioned, the beginning of the 1900s. Yeah. And uh, this was to uh, first to just a kind of escapade to see India with uh, her sister. And then she came to protect Bamba because she was getting delusions that she's Someone going to be killed kill by her. a madman. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is when she meets uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale and yeah. uh, Lala Lajpat Rai. What was it particularly about Lala Lajpat Rai? I know they had a meeting, they didn't even exchange very yeah. Many words. It was just, I mean, it was, it's, it's, a, it's beautiful. She writes about it in her diary, and it's one of the few places where you hear Sophia's voice, because frustratingly, she was a great archivist. She saved all the letters that her family wrote to her, but her letters have been scattered. All, I mean, they've been held to trace, and I haven't traced all of them at all by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but in her diary, she writes about this thing. They're having this time in, in, in Lahore, discovering the Sikh kingdom. I mean, they're traveling around the Pulkian states, and she's really devouring this place mm. and understanding for the first time what her father meant uh, to the Punjab and what the Punjab means to her. And she hears that there's going to be a lecture, because this is actually a time of febrile nationalism in Punjab. Punjab is the most uh, uneasy state at this time in 1907, and she hears that uh, Gopakrishna Gokhale is going to speak, who is the mentor of Gandhi. So those of you who don't know, this, this man was the mentor of Gandhi. So she goes and she's really excited and she's very moved and she's very interested in what he says. The next night, they hear that Lala Lajpat Rai, who incidentally is also known as Punjab Kesri, which means the Lion of the Punjab. Lion of Punjab yes. So, you know, this is a name that she has grown up with. The Lion of Punjab is going to be speaking, Punjab Kesri. So she goes and he is a great speaker. Mm. And he talks about putting pride back into being Indian, about, you know, you grow the crops, you make the goods, you sell the goods, you keep the money, why are we being robbed? And it chimes with her because, again, it's that theme of being robbed. And she is devoted. But then he does this thing. He goes, he stops his speech. He's got the whole auditorium in the palm of his hand. And then he turns around to these two girls who have been forced to sit on stage, poor things, in the VIP quarters, you know, on the stage. And he goes, and I'd like you to stand for the daughters of Ranjit Singh, the lion. And it just chokes her up. You know, that, my God, it still means something. And then he comes to see her, a friendship develops, and she becomes utterly devoted to him and his, his teaching. And you, you tell of a fascinating incident when Gokhale and uh, Lajpat Rai drop in unannounced on oh, the two hilarious. princesses. What happens? Oh, they have no, so they, because these are two people who are under surveillance from the British, so they don't like trumpeting their movements. So they just turn up one afternoon, and they are basically in the equivalent of being in their 90s and their rollers in. They are so unprepared, the house is a complete disaster area, and she cannot utter a word. She turns into this stuttering imbecile. So he's come all the way to see her and talk to her, and she can barely utter a word, and she's just so humiliated and disappointed. And she really beats herself up in the diary. She just hates herself for it. But he comes back, and then they do develop a friendship. So uh, I know this is no uh, compensation for the annexation of Punjab, but can we say that 
Punjab made Shafia what she was? I absolutely, I th uh, without a doubt. Without had a doubt. she stayed in London, had she carried on going to her parties, had she carried on just, you know, More champion dogs. dogs. There would have been a lot more dogs in the world. Yeah. <laughs> really good dogs. We would and have had cycling. great dogs. <laughs> yeah. But we wouldn't have had any of the other. I don't, th there was nothing, there was no reason. Th it was the grit in her oyster. Great. Thank you very much. And should we open the hall to questions? Question right at the back, please. Yes. Ma'am, we have heard and read the Kohinoor was never donated or gifted by Dilip Singh. Rather, it was snatched. Is it right or wrong? Hmm. Oh, I mean, I think, I think the Punjab, nothing was gifted by that young boy. How can you gift anything when you're a terrified young boy and you are surrounded by death and mayhem? Trust me, it wasn't a gift. None of it was, a, a gift is given by somebody who knows what they're doing, who knows the impact of it, and who's doing it with a free heart. This was a trembling little boy who was told and really didn't have any choice. I don't think we really call no. that a gift, myself. If I may add to that, no. the Koinur was part of Dalip Singh's Tosha Khana. And when Punjab was annexed, the Tosha Khana was annexed by Lord Dalhousie. All the items were itemized. There is a full list. Mm -hmm by John Logan, which includes the Kohinoor diamond and many other valuable things. And this was taken and shipped off by Dalhousie to Queen Victoria. Mm. If this is a gift. Mm. Oh, by the way, I, I think Victoria felt guilt for it. I mean, there's that amazing yeah, there's that scene, scene where, you know, she, she's, she loves Dalip. She does love him. I mean, some people question. I, I personally think she was really very fond of him. And she's worried about wearing the Kohinoor in public because he's never seen her with it. So he, she, and she writes about this, that she does feel guilt about it. So you don't feel guilt about a gift that has been given. We'll come back there. We have one here, right in the beginning. Yeah, there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's, it, was, it was very wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you, did uh, two things. One is, uh, is her library, is her, uh, sorry, diary currently in the British library? Is, is that where it's housed? And then the yeah. second question I had, uh, did she also interact with uh, some of her extended relatives in Punjab, like the Sandavalias, who were so influential for her father yeah. in terms of uh, so, some of his own, uh, whether delusions or transformations, however yeah. one wants to frame it? Yeah, no, so, so, so the great question. So yes, uh, the British library is a great repository for Dilip Singh papers, including this and let me tell you, the diary has been the most, uh, the best and the worst thing of my research because her handwriting was abysmal. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many migraines I went through just to get my head around it. I'm now fluent in spider vomit because that's what it looks like. She had just such a poor education, you know, those years of, um, of being neglected when her father had disowned them. She, she never had a formal education. Um, and the Sandanwali has meant a lot to her. I mean, she, I write it in the book when she first goes to Rajasansi, the, the village, which she says, I feel this is home, and I feel these are my people. And she writes about, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the prime minister of her father, uh, Thakur Singh Sandanwali, the boys are still there, and she says how much they have lost because of our family. So she's aware of it, definitely, yeah. Please, down. Hi there. I just wondered, it sounds like she was never married. Were there any men in her life? It's, uh, it, it, it's such a sad thing. She was a passionate and romantic soul. And, but she's born at the wrong time and in the wrong place. So in England, even though people will dance with her, they'll invite her to parties, they won't marry her. They won't take in, you know, some call them these, these mongrel children. Another one, I think there's a passage I include in the book that describes Dilip Singh's children as these dusky tadpoles. You know, they, they weren't marriageable material. And she didn't feel Indian. So Bambas writes her letters and does little cute sketches saying, I've met this boy, you might like him. But she doesn't feel Indian enough to marry an Indian. And, but she falls in love. I mean, there's a lovely bit in her diary when she's traveling uh, 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 to India for the, the first time. And she... Um, there's a man who's flirting with her. I mean, we can see she's fl he's flirting with her. She's the only one who can't see it for ages. She's really annoyed. He comes and he teases her about the dog. He, you know, he teases her about her care of the dog. She calls him the madman. She says, I hate nobody as much as I hate the madman. Two pages later, 
I'm really fascinated by the madman. Three pages later, where's the madman? I mean, and she's really kind of besotted, and at the end, it's so sad. You know, he goes without saying goodbye, and she never talks about it again because she's gone through so much pain in her life. I mean, this is how I think that she dealt with it. She just, anything painful, there's an end to it. And she just reconciled herself to the fact she wasn't going to marry. It's a shame. Can yeah. we take one from this side, please? Right here. Uh, why doesn't she have the spotlight after contributing so much to the suffrage movement? Yes, such a good question, and, mm. and it was one that I, I was asking myself when I first found her. Look, with the suffragettes, they, they lionize and they remember, and we remember, I mean, how many c can you name? Maybe three, four at a push? And the ones that we remember are the ones who went to prison and starved themselves to death or else killed themselves for the cause. But behind them were legions of women who sacrificed so much, and Sophia was one of, one of them. So there are, there are whole, there's a whole car crash of reasons why she's been forgotten. So in the su suffragette pantheon, there's room for about three, unfortunately, that get passed down. Although in my research, I've discovered so many amazing women. The British did not want her remembered and took active efforts to pull her out of history. I mean, in, in that picture you saw during World War I, she actively raised a lot of money for Indian troops. And they, there are letters, I mean, these, this sort of toing and froing of ridiculous letters with the British government saying, oh my God, we can't let her raise money because then she'll get the credit for it, meaning it'll stir up the Punjab. Well, we can't stop her from raising money. That'll look really bad because these soldiers are fighting for us. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Well, I know. Why don't we get another organization involved and we'll give them the credit? And that's what they do. And all of their efforts are slightly foiled at the time because uh, Lord Patrick French, who's the, the commander of troops, in World War I at the time, writes her a personal letter copying it into the Times, and it runs on their front page, thank you, Princess Sophia Dilip Singh, for raising money for these soldiers. So at the time, she was credited, but thereafter, there's this chip, 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 chipping away of her name out of history. So that's another reason that she's lost, and, that, and she had no children. There's no other kids or generations to say, look at what my family did. She didn't promote herself very well. There's a, there's a book called The Who's Who, and she was asked for her entry, and she gave one line, the advancement of women, that's it. So she was rubbish at self-promotion. So it was all of those reasons that came together. There's one right here, please, in front. Hi, thank you for a wonderful session. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned that she was greatly influenced by le nationalist leaders such as Gokhale and uh, Lala Lajpat Rai. And again, she was raising funds for troops and she was also a nurse for Indian troops. Why do you think she didn't get more involved with the cause of uh, self-rule, Swaraj, as it was known at that time? She was, she was deeply enamored of it while she was in India. But then when she got back, as I said, you know, the same cries were being heard from mm -hmm. suffragettes in London. And so she throws herself, and, and it's not a part-time job to be fighting the state. The way these women were putting themselves on the line is not part-time. You don't do it as a hobby, you know? So there was very little time, and she really believed in them. She wanted them to be okay, and she was close enough to make a difference. So I think that's why, that's why. Had she lived in India, I think things would have been different. Her cause would have been different, but she was right there at the right time, and she was winning the right fight. There's some hands up there, yes? We'll come down. Yeah. Uh, she fought so much for the vote, but uh, did she ever get to vote in her lifetime? Yes, she did. She did. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, she did. 1928, women got the vote. So she was right. there, and she, she died in 48, so she did. Yeah. I can't wait to read uh, this book, um, but my, I'm curious as to whether this has whetted your appetite and whether you've discovered any more fascinating potential subjects for your next books. Well, I, honestly, that's, uh, that's um, well, I'm really glad you're looking forward to it. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I never intended to write this. It was just, it was, it was an itch that I couldn't stop scratching. And, and, you know, I was just trying to find out for my own sake what was the story behind this picture. And then suddenly, there's a story, and suddenly then it becomes an obligation to put her back in history. I mean, I really felt the weight of that. Um, and I, I, all I'll say is that I've had another little itch in the research. So let's see. I won't say it's a book yet, but there's something that needs a scratch. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Could you stand up, please? Yeah. Hi. This was really amazing. Like The amount of research you've put in, I really 
appreciate that. Thank but you. But my um, question was about her sister because from what I've heard of her in the course of this session, she also seems like a very interesting figure, Bamba. So what happened to her and like why did she go all delusional and she seems like a very um, radical but sort of crazy and interesting figure so I would like to know more yeah, about Yeah, sure. Her. I mean, Bamba really, I mean, if anyone wants to write a book, That's a book. Write, please write about Bamba. I mean, I, I, she's, she was really not a very nice girl though. <laughs> she wasn't a very nice woman. She was very selfish and she was always after money for herself. She didn't have causes particularly. The nationalists sort of suited her hatred of the British, but she's not the kind of person who would have, I think, gone in front of a Lati charge, like Sophia did. Uh, she mixed with people who hated the British, but she never herself put herself in front of, of all of that. She died in Lahore. I mean, as, as Nabej said, she styled herself the Queen of Lahore, and she never went back. She hated Britain, hated Hampton Court, hated the life that Sophia was leading, and she ended up dying. She's buried there in Lahore. And there's one thing, uh, I'm not sure, maybe from your book or somebody else's, where they said uh, it was a, a sentence that she uttered that, I am the Queen of Lahore, but I can't even find a place on a bus. Yes. So she was, you know, it wasn't a happy, great end to her life. Yeah, that's a, that's a book in the waiting. Yes, please. Your talk was really mesmerizing. Oh, thank you. And uh, I would like to know uh, whether she uh, wanted to join her father in his pursuit of whatever he was doing for Punjab. Oh, well, I mean, she was too young. When he, when he ditched her and her mother and her sisters and her brothers, she was 11. You know, she just, uh, she, she was too young to do anything. And the next few years, he didn't want to know them. So she's just a child trying to hold her sanity together while her mother's drinking herself to death in front of her eyes. And then her brother is getting sicker and sicker and is dying and she has to deal with that. And then this same ground gets this plot of earth in Elverdon, which you visited. It's just churned and re-churned and re-churned over six years with all the people she loves most in the world and then her father gets interred there. So I don't think there were any, you know, I mean, God, first of all, she's a teenager so who, you know, who could blame her for not thinking loftier thoughts? But she's just trying so hard to hold it together. Uh, so no, I don't think that mattered to her at the time. Hi, that really was a wonderful speech. Thank you. Very informative. Um, just inquiring about how you found out about her at the beginning in the yeah. local magazine. Why was her picture in the paper? Because it was, a, it was a local suffragette exhibition. So they had, the suffragettes were particularly active. I, how many of you are from the UK, if you just took your hands up? Okay, so uh, those of you who are, uh, Richmond and Kew, aren't they terribly nice places? Terribly nice. I mean, they're <laughs> the, very rich and terribly nice. And I mean, you know, I come from one of those places, slightly boring people live. Um, I'm one of them. But, uh, they had a, but in the suffragette state, some of the most radical suffragette uh, groupings were from Richmond and Kew, and they were firebombing Kew um, quite happily. It was a great target of theirs, and post boxes around Richmond. So they had a, an exhibition. Uh, of those photographs, and that's where she came up as, as part of that. Never, have never heard of her before. Ever time before. for two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Just quickly, from 1948 for the next 20 years until her death, what causes was she involved in? She was, uh, she was really, you know, I, I mentioned that she was quite a depressive personality, and she was one of those people who needed to be needed. And those were not happy years for her. The British were sort of taking revenge, one might say, for her upstart behavior as a suffragette. And they were slightly tightening the knot every year on her uh, income. So she was kind of struggling financially. She's not feeling very needed. Bamba goes off and gets married, oh my god, to a white man, oh my god. You know, she, it's actually a marriage of convenience because Bamba wants the dowry. But you know, her world is slightly turning upside down. But then World War II happens and then she has meaning again. I mean, I showed you the picture of the the, the children, and that really is the last part of her life, the children are everything, because she suddenly has that chance to be the mother that I think she would have been a very good one, I think. According to the children, the way they tell it, she was very maternal. So they become everything. She lives a sort of fairly quiet life, uh, living in Buckinghamshire, and that's where she dies. So, you know, she sort of has that quiet, the breather years towards the end, I think, yeah. Last question, right there. Um, you mentioned that uh, she sort of pulls herself out of her whole bubblehead phase 
and then goes on to get involved with this suffragette movement, with the suffragettes. So does she write in her diary about what it is that pushed her towards finally taking up a cause yes. and fighting for that? No, but you, all, all you know is that she goes to India, a bubblehead. I wish I hadn't used that, and I feel really disloyal, but <laughs> she, goes, she goes to India, um, sort of leading this rather pointless life, and then she writes the diary while she's in India, and that's where you know how impactful Lajpatra in particular was on her, and then she comes back and straight away her life is unrecognizable. So and, there and is And she the does change. become an enemy of the British yes, Empire. Yes, she does. She says that. Yes, she does. She goes, oh, you wicked English, how I hate you, you are my enemy. And, you know, she, she says that, she writes that on the voyage home, she gets a newspaper cutting saying Lajpatra has been arrested and is going to be deported without trial and may die in prison. That's what happened to people, deported to these, these prisons. Uh, so she writes this thing, but, but then by the time she comes back, she's, you know, she's at least grown up enough, which Bamber I don't think was, to see that the people who are fighting for Large Foot Ryan Britain are British MPs. And you know, that was a great thrill as well, going through Hansard as a political journalist. Hansard is the record of note of, of anything that goes on in, uh, in Parliament. And there are these debates on the floor of the House with British MPs saying to the Secretary of State, produce Lajpat Rai. What have you done with Lajpat Rai? His arrest is illegal. This is shameful. This is not how we are. And so she's suddenly shocked back into, you can't hate a people for the mistakes of a few. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of claps for <laughs> Anita and Sophia. Thank you, Dr. Age, and thank you, Anita, for bringing Sophia home. It was actually a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Really nice. Thank you so very much for being here and giving us this lovely presentation. Anita will be signing her books at the book signing area. The books are available there. So any of you who have the book, please go at the back or buy the book there and sign the books, please. Anita is going to sign the book.